I'm Eileen Roach, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery. Thank you for joining me today. It's all about the weightless quilter, how to use it, how to set it up, how to load the quilt, flip the quilt, and finish it. We are going to talk all about that. I'm even going to, I made a mini weightless quilter so you can get a better understanding of how to use it, how to set it up. You know, quilting with our embroidery machines is something everybody wants to do right now between edge to edge or custom quilting. You have to handle the weight of the quilt. It's the only way you're going to get your top magnetic hoop of Snap Hoop Monster to stay attached to the bottom or the inner ring of your standard hoop to stay inside the outer ring. But before we get started, let's just take a quick look at um, our small town charms because we found a couple of new ones that some of you folks have done. Uh, so, and if you're joining us, you know, sign in so I can see where you are uh, watching from. We love to know where you are. So Small Town Charm, as you know, we've been doing it uh, all of 2020. In January, we did the quilt shop and it comes in two sizes, seven by 12 and five by seven. And February was the sweet shop, little bakery. And uh, I named mine Cake Superior, but I know many of your, you came up with your own name, which is exactly what I had hoped you would do. In March, we had this So Chic dress shop. And it again, five by seven, notice the awning is 3D. And in that five by seven, that's two hoopings, actually three, because you hoop the awning separately. And um, you'll uh, put that second story on the five by seven. And then in April, we had the, um, the flower shop, which actually I don't have an image of mine, but Mine's almost as cute as Judy Whitaker's. Look how adorable hers is. So she added a little gnome in the foreground and changed the name of the shop, even changed the shape of the sign. So now that uh, instead of just like an oval kind of bar, it is a very pretty um, decorative uh, sign. And she renamed it Enchanted Garden. She fussy cut some fabric and placed a woman inside the shop and then covered it with vinyl. You know, it's an applique, so you most certainly can do those different layers to get that effect, but she didn't stop there. Oh, no, no. When you lift her awning, she has a second story. And she added um, a, a sweet phrase, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. And I like that, right? Because it is very ho hopeful to plant a garden knowing that it's you're not going to reap the benefits today, but tomorrow. And aloha, Judy Warren, nice to have you here. Didn't she do a great job? She's got some gnomes up there in the attic. And in her comments on Facebook, she shared that uh, Sue S. Brown of OML Embroidery helped her add that wood floor so it would look like her gnomes were really sitting. So nice job, that's really great teamwork for um, both Sue Brown and Judy Whitaker. So nice, really lovely job. And she's got her Cape Cod seagull there. And then Patricia O'Neill Page. I love the changes that she made. So first off, the awning is adorable. I just love that brown with the little aqua, you know, they look like falling leaves or some little fleck, just very attractive. And then she renamed hers, called it the Peddler, which is really lovely. She omitted the pots on the bottom row and added decorative embroidery to the uh, stand. And so she's got a bunny inside that egg shape and then some lilies flanking the oval. But take a look on the left side of her uh, small town charm. She has a like a wrought iron chair that's a potter and filled with flowers in the seat. And then she also added a, a trailing vine that looks kind of like daisies and some ribbon work there on the top left. And she also added a, a verse of her own, which is take time to smell the flowers in the window of the door. So isn't that lovely? Judy Whitaker, you love the rabbit. The rabbit is great, right? It really looks just um, enticing. I'm so proud of all the work that everyone has done. I love seeing it and there's so much creativity. I'm working on next week's, which we unveil on Thursday, and I think you're really going to love it. It's totally different. We are um, going to have a lot of fun with that one. 
So we, I do, I'm kind of calling today's session an open studio session because I have my machine set up. I have, I'm going to load a quilt on the weightless quilter. We're also going to work on the overhead cam so you can really understand um, the weightless quilter and how it works. Many of you have already received it. Uh, we finally, you know, we, they were out of stock for quite a while, but it's shipping now. And um, we get questions through customer service if people, you know, uh, have lots of questions on how to use it. So the first thing I'd like to say about the weightless quilter is it's just intuitive and it's doing a task for you. There's almost no wrong way to set it up. But, you know, let's take a look. I prepared some slides so that you could kind of get an overhead view of it and understand the job that it's doing. In this case, here I am in a regular sewing table, a standard embroidery hoop. And look at the, you know, this is a jelly roll quilt. Look at that hot mess that is just um, hanging down off the machine, right? And that's how your inner ring pops out of your outer ring. And, you know, that's very frustrating when you are quilting with your embroidery machine. So here's a video that I did about a year ago. Maybe it's more now, but let's just take a look. I am actually going through um, the whole process is fast. It's, this video is only a minute long, but that's the size of the box. And I do already have the floor frame positioned down on the floor. And we're gonna do that live here in a little while so you understand. And I'm opening up my quilt. Now this quilt, quilt measures 50, oh, I think it's 58 inches wide by 72 inches long. And the weightless quilter is designed really for quilts about that size or larger. You know, if you have a small crib quilt, you really don't need the weightless quilter. You'll just do that um, on your sewing table. But notice how the hoop and the quilt moves together because of the weightless quilter. You know, the, it's not like, um, you know, a multi-needle machine where the hoop stays stationary. No, that's not really true. Anyway, forget that. <laughs> anyway, the whole fabric has to move with the hoop. And that's the problem of quilting with your embroidery machine because the entire quilt wants to move with it. So the weightless quilter allows the whole quilt to, to move. Now here I'm at the very end, I'm just doing my border. And you can see, now this film that you are watching is advanced, so it's very high speed and um, so it's accelerated, but I'm just about done. It really does move that fluidly. It just sways as it holds your quilt. So now I'm all done and that was, fun, really, really fun. Placement is great. I was happy with that whole project. Really, really a fun project to do. So here is um, a queen size quilt and the camera is not moving. What That movement that you see is all the weightless quilter swaying as the stitches are laid down. So that's, I just want you to see, it's moving with the hoop. And that's the whole idea. I mean, that is really what's important. Let's see. Okay, so now, so some of you are having trouble that you are Alexis Ray Melinda, and I think Esther Hoplin said you are posting your, um, ah, you're posting your, your small town charms, but the hashtag is dime so along. It's not hashtag small town charm. That hashtag small town charm is used for Southern people, um, I, I would say, but really not just Southern, people who live in a small town and they love the lifestyle of a small town, it has nothing to do with embroidery. So if you use the hashtag dime so along, that is how we're going to find your, um, your, your small town charm. So let's see. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at some other, how we basically set it up. So it's a floor frame and it sits underneath your machine down on the floor, right? That's what it means. Floor frame lays on the floor and the flex poles span away from the machine. You want them to, you know, behind the machine, push back and in the foreground in front of the machine, you can either position the poles so that it's going away from the machine to the left or towards you as you sit at the machine. Let's see. Now, Linda Bar Barkin says, when doing a larger quilt, do you use all four poles? 
I'm going to show you some images that use all four poles, but truth be told, I rarely, very rarely use all four poles, even on a queen, queen size quilt. So here you can see, now this quilt's 54 by 72. On the right-hand side, I'm working down in the lower right corner. And so the quilt is secured in three poles, two in the back and one in the foreground and, you know, in the far left side, which is the bottom right of the screen that you're looking at right now. So here's some illustrations. If you have a, a small table, you want to position the weightless quilter. You always want to position the weightless quilter so it's around the hoop, right? Let's really focus on the hoop. Not so much the head of the machine, it's the hoop because that's what's holding the quilt. So um, in, in the image on the right, you can see now the quilt is positioned, it's captured in three clamps, right? Two in the back, one in the foreground on the left. Here I am in a small space, this is actually my, uh, a sewing space in my home, and uh, that back pole against the window is touching the window and it's going to stay positioned there and sway against the window as I stitch. Now, because I'm completing the far right corner of the quilt, I have the bottom of the quilt, both edges uh, clamped in one clamp. Instead of using a fourth pole and floor bar, I'm only using that um, pole on the left front. On a large table, slide that weightless quilter underneath the table. You wanna get it close to the machine. It's not really about your furniture, it's about your machine. That's where you need to position it. Okay, on a sit down free motion, normally your, your machine is, you know, you sit kind of at the head of it. It is, uh, you're not parallel with the machine, you're perpendicular to the machine. So in this case, you most likely would use four floor, uh, four floor, um, brackets and three bars. Or on the right hand image, you can see where I, I have a big quilt and I, I need to position, grab the quilt in all four corners. So the bars in the back are not connected by a corner bracket. They literally just stay on the floor and overlap. Now, if there's any lift there, I would just throw a bag of beans there just to hold it down. Literally, you know, something like this. If you feel like it's lifting, you just hold it down with something like a bag of beans. That's really all it needs. Okay, here we have Joni Zyre Pool, who is um, oh, stitching, let me see. Oh, that's not a video, sorry about that. Well, she's a free motion quilter, um, award-winning quilter, and she has uh, she's sitting down at the quilt. Now notice she's working on the far left corner. So she only has the quilt captured in two poles to the right. You know, it's just kind of intuitive as you're working the quilt, as you're quilting along, you will know when to release it from a clamp and when not to. It's very intuitive. Here we are on a multi-needle machine. This is actually, actually Ashley Jones uh, did this image for me. She grabbed this. So now she does have all four corner brackets uh, and poles in the four bars on the floor and the corner brackets, and she's clamping all four not it's really not the corners that she has like if you look at that image uh, the clamp in the foreground on the left that's not the corner of the quilt it's about the middle of the quilt yeah okay yeah we're going to talk about the screws we're going to get to that next so hang on there okay here is uh where i am in the center of the quilt so now notice in this case, I am using all four um, corner brackets and I have them captured in the fabric clamps are holding the front of the quilt and the left side. But look in the back, I've dropped it off that back pole just because it was too taut, too much um, stress on the quilt. Kind of, if it looks like a clothesline, then it's, it's too much. Here we have um, the center of the quilt again. Now I do have all four brackets used. I don't know that I, I, this is a long time ago. I don't know that I would continue to do that. I would probably just use three. Okay, so as you are planning your quilting, you're really gonna work the quilt in quarters, right? Divide it into four quarters, one, two, three, and four. And you're going to quilt one and two first. And you're 
And it doesn't really matter if you do two first or one first. You just are doing the right side of the quilt. That's what's important. So this image here shows those round white circles show you where the fabric clamps should hold the quilt. That gray area is what is important is captured in the fabric clamps. Because if this is a king size quilt, I don't want all four corners. I just want a portion of the quilt. And then I would have the excess just hanging down. And you'll see, we'll go live over there to the machine and I'll give you a, a very clear explanation on why and how. You'll be able to see it once you have it set up like that. And then, um, you know, I may advance over a little bit because now I'm going to do, um, you know, I'm at the portion of one and two where they meet. So uh, that's pretty cool. And now lower left corner, and I'll probably drop the fabric clamp in the in the front of the quilt. There's no need to hold the quilt there because it's all spanned in the back. And lower right hand corner, same thing. And um, now I have positioned the fabric clamp in the foreground and, and in the background because I'm up near that edge. And there's a possibility, you know, depending on how big the quilt is and how much excess fabric you have around the quilt, batting and backing, you may drop that back clamp also. Okay, and then we're just here, and I, when I'm in that far right corner, I'm probably not in any clamp at all. I just have the two clamps in the bottom. Now, to do three and four, you flip the quilt. You literally rotate it 180 degrees. You'll do the very same thing with your embroidery design. Rotate that 180 degrees. And again, start in the center of the quilt and work your way around the quilt. So, um, why don't we take a look? First, I have to say hi to Marge Quinn. She's from my hometown, Wildwood, New Jersey. Hello, Marge. Nice to have you watching today. Okay, so let's go over to the overhead cam and tell you, show you what's in the bag. So when you, well, you're going to get a big box for sure. And then you'll have four fabric clamps and you will have these little finger cots and the finger cots go on the clamp. So you just place your fingers inside this opening and with your uh, palm and your thumb, you open up the clamp. And then take the finger cot. Now, this won't harm your fabric, but I just think it's, you know, these are a little bit more gentle on your fabric and they give a nice strong grip. So you'll just slide them over the clamp fingers, right? And then there you have it. That's how those four items work together. You'll also have um, a bag of it, two bags of adhesive backed felt. So you're going to have 16 pieces because the weightless quilter actually comes with eight floor bars. And we're going to talk all about that. So once you get th these all out of, uh, get your uh, finger cuts on your clamps, then take your, your, um, no, I'm, I lost a piece here. How did that happen? Okay. You apply the the felt right to the end of the, the pole. And then when it sits into that clamp, it's nice and sturdy. It doesn't really, it moves a little bit, but it does have some resistance, which is, you know, that's ideal. It's not mandatory, but it's ideal. And then you're going to take your floor bar and I have kind of put one together here. I cut it down to size so that you could see where it is. And I lost my pole. My goodness, it's just in here. Everything was all set up, but I just want you to see how easily this slides together. So you have your, your clamp. It does have a hole in it. You may have holes in your bars, but we don't need any screws because these do not go anywhere. You're just, once you put it inside, they don't slip apart. You know, it's just super easy to attach. You just slide it in. And I learned after using this product for five years, I never used the screws ever. I never used them, so we have omitted them. We've had a lot of problems with um, getting supplies during COVID, and we've had to make some decisions as a company and you know adjust the supply list or the contents of each one. So here's the one that I had that was um, just about to apply. So you're gonna peel off that protective paper and then just wrap it around. And then you're all set. So let's, let's position this like this is where my machine would sit right here. And these poles are going away from the machine. 
And then this one, when I apply, I can apply so that it's going away from the machine to the left, or I could slide it on in this position so that it's going away from the machine, but towards my body. It's just, you know, there's no right or wrong, really. There's no right or wrong. Either way works. Here, I'm showing the large, thicker poles that are sturdy. But truth be told, I almost always use this skinny flex pole. So um, let's head over to the machine so you can get a better look at how this is going to work. So I have a whole quilt here that um, I've kind of started quilting. It is basted with safety pins. That's my method of choice. And I place them about a hand's width apart. I don't fuss too much about the basting because I know that the tension of the snap hoop monster is gonna you know, create a stable surface for my quilt sandwich. So um, as I'm stitching it, you know, as I move hoop to hoop. So to load this on the weightless quilter, I first go and slip it underneath the foot. And this may be the trickiest part, especially when you have batting and a loose top, right? So you don't want to get that caught on the foot. You just fold that edge over and then slide it underneath the machine. And then behind the machine, I'm going to clamp probably about eight inches away from the edge of the fabric. And I'll clamp that first. And then I'll do about the same, about eight inches in for the back pole. And you'll, I guess maybe you noticed, but if you didn't, I'll show you. I have the bottom of my mon snap hoop monster on my machine. This is the nine and a half by 14. Doesn't matter what size you're using, you will attach the hoop to the machine and then worry about adding the top. So now I'm gonna go over and retrieve my monster top. And I do have the, uh, the <laughs> what camera are we on? I do have my hoop guard in place. Here you can see that hoop guard right here. So that's going to create a barrier so my quilt roll doesn't flip into the sewing field. So I would be starting at about center. And of course, when I'm doing this at home, I'm not sitting, you know, I'm actually sitting at the machine and I'm paying attention to my placement and so forth. But because you know I'm here on camera and, and all that, I'm, I'm not actually gonna stitch. And I'm not really worried about placement but because that's a whole nother different class. Uh, so then once I have that all positioned and I'm happy with that, and then lower my presser foot. And at this point, I will attach that front pole. And that, that's probably gonna go right on the corner, just like that. Okay, so what's that looking like? Not too bad. So before I get going, I will probably roll this edge here just to kind of keep it a little tidy. And let's trace our design. And this is what I want you to see. I want you to see how it's just the whole quilt moves. It, the whole thing is moving and it's picking up my template. So the whole quilt moves, that's exactly what you want. What you don't want is strain on the quilt. Like this is a little taut, that's a little too tight. So I can relax that by repositioning the fabric, moving away from that corner edge. And of course that's going to change. See how it's not as taut now? So let's go ahead and reposition our hoop and to do that, we just lift that top frame, position it over the head of the machine, advance the fabric to the next hooping. Of course, I would be removing my safety pins as I did that. And I'm gonna take that one out because I'm afraid when I travel across, there we go. And now I'll trace again. And I'm just tracing because it gives you an exaggerated movement. I mean, this movement actually does occur during the whole hooping session, right? The whole quilting session, but not as accelerated. That's what tracing does. It, you know, accelerates the outer perimeter of the hoop. So you can see this is working out just great. Now, what if 
What if it's lifting in the back? If you, if you, well, first off, when I quilt, I don't even pay attention to the floor at all. I don't pay any attention to it. I'm focused on the top. I want to make sure that as that needle moves, that the quilt is just swaying very gently. Um, and if it's not, if something is too tight, like, you know, really strained, you know, like a sail on a sailing ship, then I know to relax that fabric, reposition the clamp, possibly drop it in the front totally or wherever it is that you're encountering that tight area. So it's, that's the easiest way to um, reposition that. And then as we get up closer to the top, now I will consider dropping yeah, because this is, there's a lot of strain. Look, see how this is really too tight? So I'll drop that one. I'll just drop that. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna take that pin out. Cause you know, I'm on camera and, and if a safety pin gets caught in, <laughs> well, you have to open the safety pin. Oh, come on for heaven's sakes. Have to open the safety pin. Um, because we wouldn't want it to um, get caught on the foot and tear the fabric. So you, as you can see, it's just holding it up above. I do have some excess falling down here in the foreground. So I most certainly could clamp that over to this clamp and, you know, keep an eye on it. And I'm usually sitting right here. So I, if this corner needs to be posi positioned somewhere, it may very well line, wind up on my lap. So let's see, um, I also wanted to show you, I wanted to show you um, that you can trim the bars, the, not the bars, but the, um, the flex poles, oh my goodness, flex poles, because they come quite tall, they're about 60 inches tall, about that. And frankly, it's too tall for most sit-down machines. It's great for a multi-needle machine. It's great for machines that are on a counter height. But sometimes um, they're too tall for most sit-down machines. Now, you do get one skinny and one thick one that are shorter. They're about 36 inches. And um, so those two I use all the time. But sometimes um, I want to trim down the the bar the flex pole to accommodate my sewing area so i got this all set up right here hopefully you can see i've clamped my my flex pole to uh, this is actually our hooping station and i have a hacksaw just a household hacksaw but you know what a a, a steak knife and this is a bad steak knife like from sam's also work. So then just hold it in position and you just saw back and forth and it works beautifully. It just comes right off. Now, if you're worried about it splintering, you can tape the edge, you know, right where you're going to cut. It's what they do for, for mica so that you don't get a split. And then there you have it. So don't apply your felt to the, um, well, you, you get the picture. I'm not going to finish this. I've already trimmed mine. Um, only apply the felt to one end and then set up your weightless quilter and then see if you would um, want to trim from it. You know, and just do a couple inches at a time. So it's really, um, the weightless quilter is very usable, very flexible. You can't really go wrong with it. And if you're worried about it lifting a little bit, then literally put a small bean bag put a bag of beans on the floor. We don't have that problem with the aluminum bars. Some of the weightless quilters have wood bars and um, you know, there's no issues with that. So I see we have a lot of questions here about vintage software, which is not really our topic today. So um, are there any questions about the weightless quilter? And if I haven't, if I haven't uh, shown any of your um, concerns, or questions? Okay, I think we're doing all right. We got a lot of vintage software. Yeah, and Janet, you didn't know what those finger cots were for. Yeah, they're just perfect for that fabric clamp. They're really very nice. Very, very nice. 
So the weightless quilter is also fabulous for binding. And so um, I let me, if you flip over to PowerPoint, I'll show you. Now, in this case, you're only going to use the two poles on the left-hand side because you want to be able to stitch an entire straight line of stitching on one whole edge, and then you'll get up and you'll flip, you know, rotate the quilt 90 degrees, add the binding to the next edge. And Tara, you want to know, will it hold a heavy t-shirt quilt? It will hold a heavy t-shirt quilt um, as long as the hoop, the snap hoop monster is able to hold the, the fabric, then yeah, for sure. Do you have to use a snap hoop monster? You don't have to use a snap hoop monster with weightless quilter, but I can tell you the beauty of the snap hoop monster is that um, you don't have to take the entire quilt off of the machine to rehoop. Snap hoop monster allows you to leave the bottom frame on the hoop, on the machine, lift that top frame, advance the fabric and drop that frame back in place. And Judith Whitlock, you want to know how much it is. There is a price, uh, it's $2.99, free shipping this week, which is pretty exciting. So um, if, you, if you've been thinking about it, this is a good time. So here is a customer um, who sent in this image and she was concerned about she has, she has three floor bars and notice she has the one on the right side is lifting off the floor a little bit, right? So she was very concerned about that. And you can see she removed the bar. Well, actually when it was lifting like this, it was because she didn't have that other floor bar in. But really her problem here is the fabric is too tight from the hoop to the clamp. And you see that straight edge of fabric, it looks rather taut, like it's hanging on a clothesline. That red circle is telling you where the, I, I put that in there to explain to her, that's where you should re, reposition the fabric clamp into that red circle. Because when you do that, the fabric will relax and the floor bar itself will also relax and you won't have any resistance or lifting at that, you know, during that time. And um, Mary Larson, you love mine and use it on, on your handy quilter as well as the sewing machine. You must have a sit down like a Capri or, or the previous model of what that was, maybe the Moxie. Yeah, I, it's great. I, I used it. Actually, I developed this weightless quilter for free motion quilting, not for embroidery. And I asked Joni Zyre Poole, that award award winning quilter to help me in preparing, you know, and kind of testing the device. And she loved it, absolutely loved it. And so it was developed for free motion quilting because they struggle more with the bulk of the of the the weight and bulk of the quilt than embroiderers do because you know they are manually applying stitches as they rotate that fabric, right? Stitch by stitch. And some of them use rulers and oh my goodness that is just crazy you know so intensive so much talent but not only are they focusing on the painting the thread painting they are also um handling the bulk of the, of the quilt so that's really why i invented the weightless quilter and when we introduced it at quilt market several years ago and we had so many people come in and say, well, can I use it for my embroidery machine? And believe it or not, I had never used it for my embroidery machine. Well, you know, I went home after um, quilt market or fest, whatever it was several years ago, and then used it on my embroidery machine. I was like, duh, why didn't I do this earlier? It's awesome. So yeah, that, that's um, how that all came to be. There's always a story behind every product, right? And oh, Linda Soder, you love it. You've been using it for binding as well as quilting. That's awesome. That's really great. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, okay, so I think we kind of covered all your questions. If you have questions about Weightless Quilter, please ask them now because I, you know, went, I really wanted to make sure that everyone understood how to use it. Um, and Ashley Jones, yep, she says it has been tested up to 42 pounds, of the weightless quilter. So if you're using a heavy t-shirt quilt, yeah, it'll hold it for sure. Again, just remember, you're, you don't have to hold all four corners in the quilt. You're going to work in areas, you know, like this quilt that I'm working on right now is only 54 inches wide. So that's not very wide. But if it was a queen, then I most certainly would be clamping 
the fabric about 18 inches in from the side edge, right? And, and then it would drape like that, yeah. Thanks to Ann Banco. She says she loves the stories behind inventions. Thank you, me too. It, without them, nothing comes to life, I can tell you that. So um, next week we have the small town charm for May. And I think it's going to be a whole lot of fun. I, I know you'll enjoy it because you've been um, following along all year and, and making your own. So remember, the hashtag for your small town charm is hashtag Dime Sew Along. And hopefully we will find yours. And let's see, uh, Sharon Johnson's, are extra poles available so we can keep some long for multi-needle and have shorter ones for sewing machine? I guess you could, we don't currently sell them separately, but I'm sure we could do that for you, Sharon. Um, you get eight poles and you never ever need eight poles. So I would suggest cutting, you know, four short and four tall. That, you know, well, you don't have to cut them tall. You just leave them <laughs> that length. So, yeah. Uh, let's see, Judith Whitlock says, uh, I think it would save you a lot of money in the long run. If you go to a quilt shop, they charge you at least $100 for each quilt. Oh, definitely $100. Yeah, we, that's very true. So you can either quilt by paycheck. That's what we call it, paying someone else to finish your quilt. But, you know, we pour our heart and souls into these quilt tops that we make, right? They're normally, you know, for our own personal use, someone in our family, or they're a gift. And, you know, to be able to do that last touch of quilting the embroidery machine, I mean, quilting with your embroidery machine just means so much. It's just a great feeling of satisfaction when you actually finish the entire quilt on your embroidery and sewing machine. It's really awesome. So I encourage you to do that. Yeah, or Terry Sigler says, or they will charge you $20 per hour to rent their machine, but then you have to do that in their store at their convenience. Um, you know, and not necessarily your consent, your, your convenience. Yeah. And Joanne Banco says, nice to be able to say you stitched it yourself from beginning to end. I agree. Definitely. I mean, I don't want to bash the long arm quilters, you know, lots of people make their living quilting for other people. And that's a, a very respectable career for sure. And it's, it takes a lot of talent to do that. But uh, we also have the ability to do it on our own machine. So why not, right? With a very affordable tool like the Weightless Quilter, you know, you can. You can do it all on your own. So that's awesome. Well, I hope that I answered all your questions. We've really been trying to, um, you know, let's see. How do you claim your quilt if you send it out? I have no idea, Linda Burke. I don't know. How do you claim your quilt if you send it out? I've never done that. I've always quilted all my own. So that's, that's a great, uh, you know, so I don't know how much you pay, how you get it to do it. I know you don't have control over the design. I mean, maybe a little bit, but if you want it custom quilted, that's a lot more money than all over quilting. So um, anyway, you'd have to call your local uh, quilt shop and find out what they would charge and how that all works. So I really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much. And we will see you next week when we reveal the April, the May small town charm. Bye for now.